I was listening to the radio on the way in this morning, and it was a, a Briscoe. I'm not sure which Briscoe. There's a number of them that, that preach on the radio, but it was one of the Briscoes, and he was talking about uh, the already not yet of the faith. He was bringing up how when we're in Christ, we have the promise of the kingdom within us. We are already entered into the kingdom of God. It has already occurred. When we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are already in the kingdom. But yet, the kingdom has not yet come. There will be a time when Jesus reigns on this earth and we will be in the kingdom. Uh, this that's that already and not yet that he was talking about. And really, it connects well to the sermon in that our hope then is placed in that not yet. While our rest and our peace and our faith lies in the already. We're already secured for that eternal kingdom to come, just waiting for it to arrive. And, and there's a real joy there. As we start this new series in uh, the first chapter of Colossians, that's all we're going to make it through. We'll go through the first chapter of Colossians, and we're going to call it Christ at the Center. For the next few weeks, we'll be exploring the roots of the Christian faith and the source of all truth in Jesus Christ himself. Christ at the Center. Uh, and this chapter begins with a, a work of... Paul's as he lifts up the name of Jesus as the cure-all for all of the many varied theologies and belief systems, spiritual beliefs and practices found in the society around Colossae. And the city was once a prominent center. It was a trade route uh, that that connected the east to the west, and it actually went right through the city until about an, uh, at, at one point an earthquake came and destroyed the city completely. And when they rebuilt it, they rebuilt the road around Colossian, Colossae and moved it to Laodicea and Hierapolis. Those two cities then became prominent centers, and Colossae just kind of faded in the background. But even so, that previous time in uh, in the spotlight, brought in many different cultures, many different belief systems, many different religious practices. And reality is, that's not too much unlike our own, correct? I mean, think about the people, you know, just the people around you. You've got, I'm, I'm confident, Lutherans and Catholics and Baptists and Presbyterians. Maybe you know some Muslims and some Jews. Maybe you know a, a, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. You, you know Buddhists or Hindus or, or my favorite one, uh, those that are spiritual but not religious. Um, we know all sorts of people with all sorts of ideas about who God is, how many gods there are, how do we worship him, how do we approach him. They have all of these set boundaries and they put the place, uh, the 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 periods in different places. And if we expand that out to not just people we know, but people we've read about, people we've seen on TV, it's exponential, the many different views about God. And that's just our Western culture. That's not taking into account all of the Eastern philosophies that, that most of us wouldn't, under, wouldn't uh, recognize if I said the names of them. Uh, these views are, are varied and many. And this is the exact same situation Paul is dealing with in the book of Colossians. Colossae was a center of trade. So there's belief systems and philosophies from all over the world gathering here and being mixed with the people. And they have uh, the, the whole pantheon of Greek and Roman gods, which you'd expect, but they have the Egyptian and the Persian deities as well. They had those that didn't believe in God at all and, and rejected the gods, and then they have the Jews who are a one God people, but they have all of these very strict ways in which you must know God and strict ways in which you, in which you must live with God. This is all combining um, in, in Colossae, and it's very much the same situation we find ourselves in today. And as such, Paul's encouragement to the Colossians becomes very much an encouragement to us, because it's our situation too. Paul writes Colossians to a people who have a strong faith, and a faith based where it should be in the hope offered by the gospel, the hope offered by being in Jesus Christ. Amid all the, non the noise of religious and spiritual lies, these believers have been grounded in the truths of the scriptures. And they've seen the gospel grow and expand around them. It's a letter of encouragement then. It's an exhortation as the Colossians have held strong and have remained grounded in the truth. Paul tells us the reason he is writing this letter then is not to rebuke them, but to warn them and to prepare them for the false teachings that are around them. They're going to be surrounded by it. They're already holding fast, but here's what's coming your way. Uh, Paul writes in Colossians 2, 1 through 5, he says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for all those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. 
My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. They may know Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul's concern is that this church would not be deceived, but that they would stand firm. He says, I'm absent from you in body, but I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are in your faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on to clarify what he's worried about, drawing them away, are the traditions of men, the philosophies of this world. They're always calling on us, always trying to, as Paul says it later, capture us. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. These deceptive philosophies will take us captive if we allow them. May we take this warning to heart. While there are many traditions and many deceptive philosophies of men, there is one Christ, one Lord, one source of truth. And as we see over the next few weeks, being in Christ, being one with him, and bringing, being firmly grounded in the gospel will make all the difference. He is our protection from false belief. He is our strength to live this life. He is the source of creation itself, and he is the message that we are to preach. Charles Spurgeon once said, if Christ be anything, he must be everything. He's foundational. He's central. He is everything. And this is the truth of Colossians. In the midst of all the chaos of this world, the false belief systems and the distractions that we encounter, it is Christ who stands as a rock and firm foundation, being in him, trusting him, and placing our hope in him alone will unlock all of the promises of Scripture. He will guide our steps. He will lead us into all righteousness. He is our protection. And finally, one day, he will take us to be with him eternally. Hope eternal in Christ. This is the background of the letter of the Colossians. This is where we start this morning. We're going to be in Colossians 1, just the first eight verses, 1 through 8. A few Bibles, it's 8.33, and we're going to look at the introduction and opening prayer Paul offers us. And his prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. As Paul is encouraged by the report from Epaphras about how the Colossian church is doing, and he begins by thanking God for the good news he is hearing. Good news based in, in their faith that has been displaying itself in demonstrations of love for fellow believers. And his faith and love has grown then out of their hope in Christ. And Paul uses the foundation here to build the content of the rest of the letter. This is the point where he sets out all that will hold us firm through the rest of the book of Colossians. It's their foundation in Christ that will not only protect them from false teaching, but lead them in true life now and an eternity of treasures laid up for them in heaven. So beginning in verse 1, Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all of its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear, brother, our dear fellow servant. And actually, just to tie this home a little bit, that word servant there is actually slave. So this is the same as our shirts. We're slaves of Christ. Paul recognizes Epaphras as a fellow slave of Christ come to minister to you in Colossae. So just a side note there. So our fellow minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. Paul's opening is a very common one. It's the way the ancient letters were written. He says who he is, who is with him, and who he is writing to. But it, even as this is common, it stands out for two reasons. He makes mention of his apostleship in Christ 
and his connection with the Colossians as fellow members of one body. He has never met them before, but he recognizes they are all connected together in Christ. We prayed for uh, the Pulowskis this morning. Some of you have no idea who the Pulowskis are. But we can all recognize that we are brothers in Christ. And when we pray for them, just as Paul prayed for the Colossians, we pray as family. Our brothers and sisters striving after those uh, Chinese in, in different parts of the world. They have a mission that given by God to reach out to the Chinese population. And we have responsibility as brothers and sisters, as one family in Christ, to reach out with them. We support missionaries all over the world. And we are united to them in Christ. It's that simple word, in, that becomes so important throughout this whole letter. The Colossians are in Christ. Their hope is stored for them in heaven, in the gospel, in the word of truth. Their love is displaying itself in the spirit. In means in union with, to be one with, to be joined closely to. And it's actually the same word used in John 10.38 where Christ is speaking of his relationship to the Father. He says that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Or as a promise to us in John 15, 4, remain in me, and I will remain in you. And Romans 8, 9, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. This opening then speaks of the intimacy we have with Christ. The intimacy then that that gives with each other and our brothers and sisters all over the world. Paul is writing to this church family here in Colossae, just like us. The gathered believers around Colossae, the gathered believers of different backgrounds, politically different backgrounds, socially different jobs, different uh, activities, all united together, united in Christ. And as routine, routine as these words can be, especially in Paul's writings, these, these are words that should be celebrated. For those that are in Christ, there's nothing more that needs to be done to earn favor with God. There's nothing that needs to be done to maintain this status. There's nothing that needs to be done to make sure that we're not taken out of being in Christ. Paul starts the letter by recognizing he is speaking to those already in Christ, secure in him. And from there, he goes on to describe how he thanks God for that reality. We must see that he does not thank the Colossians for their good works and their skill which brought them into Christ. He doesn't commend them for their understanding of Scripture that allowed them to see what others did not and to achieve faith in Christ. Paul does not place the achievement at the feet of the Colossians at all. He thanks God that they have the faith that they have. The faith that shows itself in acts of love was given to them by God. And this Paul says this elsewhere in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. We cannot earn faith. There's no amount of works, no specific prayers, no mystical rites that will gain us access to Christ. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then once faith is granted, once we are in Christ, then we will walk in good works, the good works we were created to do because God is at work in us to do those works through us. The message to all of us then is if we're trying to find favor with God, through even the good things of faith, uh, Bible reading, listening to online preachers, sitting under charismatic teachers, if you're trying to earn favor with God by doing these activities, you've missed it. True faith is a gift. You can't earn it, and once you have it, it will always be yours. Yes, good works do follow true faith, but they always follow true faith. Sometimes we work so hard to try and please God, we have no idea what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We, we can't even understand that. Are, are, are you resting in God? 
I mean, are you really, truly, can you say that you are resting in Christ Jesus? Finding rest in him. Learn from him, yes. Serve him, yes. But rest in him, assured, yes. Yes. And this is what Paul is opening up for us in these first few, few verses. If you are in Christ, you are secure in him, and you have already achieved everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So what does that mean? Where do we go from there? It means a change of perspective. Our time in the scriptures is a time then to step back from the chaos of the day and the rest of the world allowing him to speak to us, allowing him to grow us. Prayer is an opportunity to release our cares to him and allow him to grant us the peace his word promises. Sunday mornings become a time of joy and fellowship with our brothers and sisters and an, a worship of God who loves us and cares for our every need. We approach the things of faith as children already accepted by God in Christ, not as trying to earn favor with him, and these spiritual practices then grow us in our ability to rest in him, to truly enjoy him. So if you've been avoiding Bible study, reading, or, or prayer, that can change today. And if you've not been regularly attending the preaching of his word on Sunday mornings, I hear there's a pretty good preacher that's starting a series in Colossians. I think you can get in on. <laughs> Continuing next Sunday. Uh, but do so for the joy in it, for the rest in it. As Hebrews tells us, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He is the pioneer and perfecter. We follow him. We rest in him. And we look to Jesus as the source of our new identity. We have become new creations in him and as the ground we need to walk faithfully, faithfully through this life. Paul is saying our identity is to be found in the person and work of Jesus Christ and that this identification has been given to us as a gift from God. Our connection with God and with the church around us is secure in Christ because he is our identity. Our confusion and struggles in this world often come when we forget this reality. And that's why Paul opens this letter by thanking God because he recognizes the faith of the Colossians in Christ, is in Christ. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in word of truth the gospel that has come to you. While Paul will go on later in this book to confront false teachings and all that's going on around Col Colossae, he doesn't start there. That's not his beginning point. Warren Wiersbe adds, adds to that thought. He says, Paul did not begin by attacking the false teachers and their doctrines. He began by exalting Jesus Christ and his preeminence. The people to whom Paul was writing had become Christians because of the gospel message brought to them by Epaphras. If this message was wrong, they were not saved at all. The beginning is the gospel. And the work of God in redemption, there will always be false teaching. There will always be false teachers. Until our Lord returns, this world is set against our king and his kingdom. And there is a place for warning and rebuking those teachings, but all of the rebuke in the world does nothing if you do not have your foundation in the truth, your hope in the son of life. If you are not in Christ, then it doesn't matter at all. Paul recognizes that. It begins with the gospel, the word of truth. Paul says the Colossians' hope is stored up for them in heaven. And this reminds me of the series we just left, right? In, in Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your heart, your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Paul says the hope stored up in heaven, the hope offered in the gospel is what has blossomed into true faith among the Colossians. Their love is being seen because of their faith amongst their brothers and sisters. It's spreading. People are talking about what is going on in this church amongst these people. The Colossians' heart was in their treasures stored for them in heaven. Theodore Epp comments on this concept. He says, almost everybody talks about faith because Almost everyone has faith 
in something. But faith is only as good as its object. It is important to recognize that we are not saved from condemnation by having faith in faith. Paul commended the Colossians for their faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not sufficient to tell a person, just believe. The question is, believe what? The message of the gospel is not to believe in yourself or in your church or in your doctrines, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. One can summarize saving faith as a commitment to Jesus Christ, who is our life and our Lord. The hope that shows itself in the Christian walk is the hope based in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Hope placed firmly in the gospel is what produces that faith-filled life for truly and truly loving works. It starts there, putting everything we're all in in Christ. Again, Paul describes this reality in its already accomplished state as an encouragement to us and to his hearers then. Those who have their hope firmly placed in the gospel, whose faith is in Christ and is displaying itself in love for the saints, those believers have their hope stored up for them in an eternal heaven waiting for them who are called to enjoy it. It's stored up there. It's waiting. It's ready. And the emphasis then is on the gospel and what it has done in the lives of these believers to take them from lives of sin and condemnation and deliver them into hope eternal stored forever in Christ Jesus. So where is your hope this morning? I mean, take it seriously. Where is your hope this morning? There's a lot of things we put our, our hope in that, that just don't pan out. Is your hope in your health? Some people like to work out and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but is your hope in your body holding out? What happens when it doesn't? When, when we grow older, we get sick. What happens to our hope then? We, is our hope in our finances? We've got enough stored up for us that we're going to get through. We can, we can weather the next storm. We all know how quickly those markets crash and how that affects everybody. Finances are not stable. Is your hope in your knowledge and what you know, the degrees you've attained? God says very clearly, the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. Our true hope that weathers all storms, that leads to eternal life, that grows in this life now and is found only in Jesus Christ. We're in Wearsby again commenting on this, uh, verse 5. says, how do we know that we have this hope? The promise is given in the word of the truth of the gospel. We believers do not have to work up a good feeling of hope. God's unchanging word assures us that our hope is secure in Christ. In fact, this hope is compared to an anchor in Hebrews 6.19 that can never break, can never drift. We are secured eternally in Christ. Our hope is secure in the word of truth, secure in the gospel, secure in the scriptures, secure in Christ. Not because we have the ability to grab it and hold on to it, but because it is a promise of God for all of us. He has grabbed a hold of us and he will always hold on to us. All who are the called according to his purposes. So we see then, even this hope is a gift from God. And is, it grows as a result of God's working, not anything we can have done. And this gospel is of its own accord, growing amongst the people of Colossae and throughout the world because of its nature as God's gospel, as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has within it the seeds of life itself. And it's not something Epaphras has done, not something Paul has done. It's not something that the Colossians are doing that is growing this hope, that is growing the results of this gospel. No, the gospel, whenever it is truly preached, everywhere that it goes, grows of its own accord. It produces fruit. This is just another continuation of the idea in Isaiah 55 where God says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purposes for which I sent it. It will do what it was called to do. It will do what it's supposed to do. It, it grows of its own accord. So why did God send it? John says in his gospel, but there are, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He sent it to give life. 
Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God would have all, all know of the grace and peace that is offered in his son. The message goes forth that there is rest for our souls in the loving arms of a savior who can free you from the false theologies of this world. This is a message of true hope and it's growing yet today. Everywhere it goes, it produces fruit, not just among these outside of the church, but here amongst us. God is building up his children into the image of son. We are seeing people baptized, giving their lives to Christ. We are seeing people uniting themselves clearly and visibly in their Lord. We are daily becoming more like Christ, and this is a work of the Holy Spirit accomplishing within each of us who are in Christ, and he's working in love through us. Paul says in verse 8 that Epaphras also told us of your love in the Spirit. This is the only mention of the Holy Spirit in the entire book of Colossians. Right here. But it's interesting and telling that he is mentioned in relationship to the working out of love as shown by the Colossians. The love that is springing forth from the hope they have in the gospel. The love that is being seen among all the saints. The love that is being commended here by Epaphras and Paul is a love based in their relationship to God in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit at work within them because of their faith and being in Christ that is displaying itself in love for all of the other saints. He moves in and he moves out. He just works through you to do all that he has ordained. And these are promises of God to us. We can hold fast to them as truths. If we are in Christ, if we trust it fully in the gospel, the word of truth, then our hope is secured, stored up for us in heaven, and this hope will produce greater levels of faith in Christ as we, through the working of the Holy Spirit within us, see it displaying itself in love for the saints. We're free to study God's word, pray, give, serve our brothers and sisters, love our neighbors, accomplish all of those things we've just talked about in the Sermon on the Mount series. We can do all of those things because he is in us and we are in him. And we can do all of those things not to please him, but in joy and a rejoicing of knowing he is already pleased with us in Christ. Paul begins this letter by rejoicing in the work of God. That the Colossians are secure in Christ and he will use that platform to build on the coming verses and chapters and he wants the Colossians to know the foundation for their faith is their relationship with Christ. The life we live is bound up with him, his will for our lives and his work within us. The one who created all things has reached down and joined himself to us eternally. And the one who placed the stars in the sky is there to walk every step of this life with you. The God of the universe invites you to greater levels of faith, love, and hope in his continuing grace in your lives. So what do we do with a passage like this? We always want to know what do we do I'll tell you what to do. Just thank God. Rejoice in him and thank him and praise him. He has brought you into his family. He has done everything to grant you salvation and peace and hope eternal. Live for him out of a love for him, not out of a duty for him. He cannot be any more pleased with you than he already is in Christ. And there is a freedom in that message. A freedom to look to God with confidence, trusting that one who has brought you into Christ will complete his work. As Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He will do those things because they are promises from him. I pray we all walk away this morning then with greater confidence in the love of God in Christ a greater trust in his work in and through our lives, and a greater boldness to declare that glorious grace to those around us. Let it be a foundation of speech as well, to reach out in the love we've been shown. But all of these truths are only relevant if you are currently in Christ. His entire letter is written to those who know they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, If you're not in Christ, then you're susceptible to all of the false ideologies of this world. You're you're not subject to any of the promises of Scripture at all. Any of the promises we've looked at, they don't belong to you. The first step is to be in Christ. 
And today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. If you recognize that you are not currently sitting in Christ, then now is the time to change that. He calls you to look upon your sinfulness and your need for forgiveness, to see all the false ideas you've had about God, all of the idolatry in your heart where you've made a God that is more comfortable for you, but not the God of the Bible, not the God of Scripture, not the Lord of hope. Repent. Turn from that sin and idolatry and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. He welcomes you. All who will humble themselves before him and trade their sin for his righteousness, freely offered. Recognize your need and accept that free gift. Then, and only then, will you begin to see his working in your life. The love that is displayed. And then you will see and experience all of the promises of scripture. And this is where communion comes in this morning. Christ has done it all for all of us. He's called us to him. He's died on our behalf. He's granted us peace with God. His death became our death, and we have been forever, forever united with him. It's finished. He is our great reward, and his gift of life eternal was won for us at Calvary. So may we take this time during communion to remember the cost of forgiveness, But even more than that, the grace extended to us to be truly and eternally united to God in Christ. What a joy. I'm going to give you a fair warning. We're doing communion silent this morning. This is an opportunity, it may be uncomfortable, but this is an opportunity for us to truly thank God, to rejoice in his gift that communion is, his body and his blood given for us that we may be united to him eternally. We are in Christ. And all those that are in Christ, I welcome you to take communion. We are open communion here. But if you're not, I I pray you to let these elements pass you by, and I'd love to talk with you after the service about that. But I want us to do this as an opportunity to draw near to him, to think on him, and to praise him. So as the ushers come forward, would you pray with me? Father, I can do nothing but thank you. You do all things well and you work all things out to the glory of your name. I praise you. I lift your name in thanks and praise, especially as we come to communion. The gift of your life, the gift of your body and your blood, given freely, given in love for us. Father, I pray that that hits home and that we recognize the security we have in you because of this accomplishment. That we do not have to earn favor, but that we get to work as slaves of Christ. We get to be your servants. And there's joy in that. Recognizing our fellowship with you is everlasting. Build that in us. Grow us in it. Help us to see it more and more. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit that is active among us, and may you receive all the glory from our lives. Amen.